The F and Rad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Vans. Oh yeah, I wanted to be absolutely not attractive to snowboarders. Maybe we need an injection of that, because it'd be interesting. And I didn't sign the contract, I just had it in my bag for a couple of months. <laughs> and we're all like, oh, that's just banging, let her run. We pushed each other to become better. Front three tailed it. Season 5 of the F and Rad Snowboard Podcast is sponsored by Wired Snowboards, the Boardroom Snowboard Shop, Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, B.C., and on Optics, and, of course, Crow's Nest Barbershops. Support also comes from the three local mountains in Vancouver, Mount Seymour, Grouse Mountain, and Cypress Mountain. Thanks to all our sponsors for all the support this season. This week's guest is Todd Richards, and I'm a huge Todd Richards fan. Todd grew up skateboarding and brought his experience of riding halfpipe to the early years of snowboarding competitions and quickly rose to the top of the ranks. Then he consistently placed on the podium during his halfpipe competition years and graduated to slope style where he continued to win. He crushed video parts with the majors like Hatchet, Fall Line Films, and Mac Dog. He drove sales for Moro Snowboards with Pro Model Boards over the years. He's been turned into a video game character. He's had an action figure made in his likeness. He's acted in a Hollywood movie. He's written a book and he's remained an outspoken voice in snowboarding straight through until now. He's still a commentator for NBC for snowboarding, including the last four Olympics. He's been involved in the startup of several successful companies. He's a loving dad and a caring husband. And Todd continues to be a dedicated surfer, skateboarder, and snowboarder. His garage, where we recorded this, looks like the garage out of an action sports movie set with bikes and boards of every kind in every corner. I set up my mics on a snowboard lying across Audi aluminum car rims and had the best time ever interviewing the legendary Todd Richards. The first person that I knew that moved here was Ingemar. Oh, wow. Ingemar lived in Cardiff, and it was like Ingemar lived there, and then um, it just seemed like the whole industry was here. Yeah. Because trans, I mean, when trans world was was. was full, full on, it was like people would come here in the summer and like every snowboarder wanted to surf. Yeah, so it was like everyone just came here. So it is. It's about the surfing and then the the proximity to the yeah. Bags. You can skate and you can surf and then everyone's sponsors were like an hour away. Yeah, so yeah. you're going into oh yeah, right. Of course, so there's sponsors. <laughs> Everything was right here. Right, yeah. right, right, right. I just didn't get it the first time I came down. I was like, this is just weird. This it is, is weird. It's not the right place for snowboarding to have an epicenter. No, you'd think it would be like Colorado or something. Tahoe? Just, yeah, Tahoe. Yeah. Tahoe makes sense. It's mm-hmm. still in California, but there's no infrastructure mm-hmm. there. There's no, nobody's going to have their brand based yeah, out of like it's weird. North Lake or something. There's yeah. no, or Reno, you wouldn't have, a, mm-hmm. like, that's not going to happen. I think they've tried, though. Really? Yeah. Who would have done it? Somebody uh, would have. I mean, in. Shit, I forget who had their... But there's definitely been, like, SPT, Snow, uh, Snow Park Technologies, was out of Reno. Yeah. And, like, you know, if you want to snowboard, you yes. need to be near yes. the mountains. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Wow, Reno is so close to some amazing shit, dude. Yeah, that's that's nuts. I consider you the historian for snowboarding. Are we I going? Do. Yeah, we're oh, going. Oh, okay. <laughs> I consider you, I consider you, the, I consider you the, the person who's most informed my view on what snowboarding is especially the olympics oh yeah and i've it's mostly because of that sweep thing that you talked about Mm -hmm. that winter olympics was just kind of shitting the bed and it wasn't something that they could really sell it was like a secondary olympics by like yeah a huge landslide and then snowboarding came in and the sweep by the Americans yeah, in the 2002. second one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2002 was just, that was it. Like, the first one was kind of a disaster. Oh, my God. With the Ross thing. But, and I mean, the, it was yeah. It was a disaster, but it, at the same time, it was so snowboarding. Yeah. Because, it, I mean, because the Ross gets busted for weed, <laughs> and then it's, like, raining. You, you know, couldn't have you know, written it better. It, it, yeah. I'm kind of glad that I was part of that one. Yeah. And then 2002 came along, and it was, like, bright sunshine the pipe was perfect it was like the chili peppers are playing and i mean it was like and i didn't i didn't qualify to to make it in 2002 because I, I thought you did no i didn't that was 98 in, in 98 i went in 2002 i was like kind of transitioning to slope style yeah so i was like oh i'll just phone it i'll just phone this in sure, and i'll sure, for sure, sure make the team sure. and i didn't make the team oh no but i remember like i was 
we were doing a photo shoot at Snow Summit at the same time. I think we were actually, I was filming with the robot food guys and I was driving up the road and Gus Buckner, who was my, he was my team manager for Oakley at that point, was at the top of the pipe and he's like, oh my God, Ross is dropping in right now. Here we go. The boys are up. Ross is in the biggest air ever. And then he comes down and then he's like, Ross is in first. Oh my God. You could just hear it. And I was getting a blow by blow of what was happening. <laughs> and I was so excited and so like melancholic at the same time. Like I didn't want it until I couldn't have it. Got it. You know? So it yeah. I mean, yeah. but that's when it blew up. Like the, the, the three musketeers, they, they, you know, were on the podium. They had like all these crazy commercials and yeah. Yeah. That's when it blew up. But yeah. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that until I heard you say it. Mm-hmm. Like I, I did, I'm not, I'm not that smart. I don't put those things together, but that was definitely having, because the Winter Olympics, the U.S. didn't give a shit about them no. ever. And then they sweep, and now all of a sudden they cared yeah. a lot. Well, I think they saw that they could make money. And it's like, yes. you know, I yeah. had a couple of friends that were over here yesterday, and they're from Sweden. And they, we were just talking about Winter Olympics, and they're like, look, like Norway, Norway is an Olympic machine. Like they have more Olympic medals than any other country. So it's massive there. But the U.S. was like, you know... They they were competitive in hockey and like downhill skiing, sort of like Phil Mayer and Steve Mayer, like the, like the, but it wasn't like it is now where it's you know it's like the figure skating and the snowboarding, like all right. they're seeing is this medals and right and it was it definitely you know it opened up a door to another demographic of people yeah and I mean like granted I think that Sean had a lot Sean White had a lot to do with that. Sure. Like more so than Ross and Danny and JJ. I think when Sean won in 2006 and there, it was already like the hype train and he had like a catchy nickname, the flying tomato and like the <laughs> X games was happening. It was a full, like the stars really aligned for Sean and for the Olympics and, and mass hysteria. Basically. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That it just steps up each mm-hmm. one. I went back and watched the runs or one or two runs from the finals of 98, mm-hmm. which I was like, ooh, wow. Yeah, it's <laughs> 2002, crazy. I'm like, holy geez, it yeah. really stepped up. And then I watched the 2010 ones, because I remember seeing that live. Mm-hmm. We were sitting there in Vancouver, and we're at the D.C. headquarters, and we're just everybody watched the finals, and it's like, that. where can it go from here? It was here? incredible. And then... In, I mean, 2014 was kind of lackluster because the pipe sucked. Okay. But then, like, 2018, the last Olympics, I mean, I, I sit there and, like, <sighs> Sean is impressive on, on a crazy level where he's he goes so big that I'm like, wow. Yeah. But, like, Ayumu and Scotty, um, I, I Scotty James is the most technical snowboarder that's ever lived. As far yeah. as I'm concerned, right. in the half pipe, I mean... Yeah. The stuff that he does and the way that he approaches tricks and the tricks that he decides that he's going to like put in a run, yeah, d- like I just think of all the horrible things that could go wrong. Like anything switched backside <laughs> to me was always like it was a struggle, and I had to force it. But for yeah. him, it just like there's so much time, and he's like he's like six foot three, and the, and the, he doesn't make it look like That's he's crazy. some weird tall guy on a snowboard, you know. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. For me, it would boil down to Danny Davis's. Air to sure. Fakie. Yeah. I just that's all I saw of yeah. it. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it, yeah, that's yeah. all that registers for me. I'm not a competition guy. I think I've I tried to compete in the early nineties. Mm-hmm. You know, when before there was slope style, there was just the single big air yeah, jump yeah, thing. Sure. And I was still hitting the girl jump is what they called it at the oh, time. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, the other T. <laughs> yeah, you would go to the ladies' T and you'd just be like, uh I can't believe how gnarly it got so fast. And it's, I mean, on the men's and women's side of things, it's, it's, yep. I watch women's slope style now. And it, uh, to be completely honest, when I commentate, yeah, it's more exciting for me to commentate because the guys, I know what they're going to do before they even drop in. Right. It's like, Oh, we're going to, if it's a slope style, I'm like, Oh, McMorris is going to do the, <laughs> you know, the triple cork, uh, 16, uh, yeah. 20. Yeah. And then, but the women, it's like every competition, there's like, Oh my God, someone else has the double court 10. Okay, she's going to go for the 12. So it's always like you're watching progression happen from event to event. Rad. And, it, and I think that's really like, I don't know, it just brings the spark of excitement back. Because of it course. does, I mean, when you when you announce enough events and you're, and you're there and you're watching, like, especially half pipe, like, I know what all these dudes are going to do before they drop in. And it's, 
I want to be shocked. And that's why, like, you know, you got, like, um, like uh, Ben Ferguson or, or Danny Davis. They come in and they flip the script. Yeah. And, like, what you think is going to happen doesn't happen. And that's why they become the people's champs. And that's, unfortunately, the judges don't often reward that because yeah. they're, they've they, are, they painted themselves in a corner. Yes. But, I mean, that's what we want to see. And I, I, and I feel like we get that with the with the women because yeah. they're they're just they're blowing minds. That's rad. Yeah. That's rad. The original uh, girl that blew my mind, Jana Mayan, mm-hmm. it was it was a shared part with you in like Project Six yeah. or something. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I remember being like that girl. That's the oh, one. Yeah. She's going to be the one. Like, Jan, I mean, Jana was untouchable for untouchable years. Yeah. Best style. Like, Best style. Just, it's, it's all style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's un- incredible. What was it like riding with her? Who uh, who was she like? What's um, her... I actually lived with Jana for like a short period of time in Colorado. And, yeah. you know, she was just... She just was hungry for it. You know? She was full tomboy. Yeah. Um, she went through her like life phases where like she was super shy and didn't really, you know, didn't really talk to too many people to psycho party. <laughs> like all of a sudden went from like zero to a hundred, like a bunch of tattoos, like <laughs> yeah. smoking cigs, like passing out. <laughs> and then she came, she kind of bottomed out like some people do. And then she kind of, she kind of went the opposite way where she was just full clean sober right. and, and like, you know, just focused on her riding. And for a long time, I mean, she was the one that was like the first girl to do a 900 and like off her toes and like. It, she could show up at the X Games or any of these competitions, and it was her competition to lose. It just depended on what kind of a day she was having. Unreal. That's and, right. I mean, she was just strong, and yeah. that's that's the best way I can describe her riding is she was strong. Yeah, yeah, that's rad. Yeah, at that time too, like it felt like the worlds were so far from parody. Mm-hmm. Like it felt like like even my attitude, and, and I, I imagine that I kind of represent the the normal attitude at the time. It was like, well, women can't be as good as men. Yeah, I mean, right? I mean it's, it was such a different time on the planet. It was. You know, and it's yeah. like, that's no excuse. And it, you can you can get into this murky zone now where you say the wrong thing and you're oh, going to totally. you get your head chopped off. But sure. truth be, it was the skill wasn't on par. Right. It was just... The skills weren't there. There hadn't been a breakthrough in progressive riding, especially, you know, as far as like height, like how high. Sure. Yeah. And it was like Jana was the one that broke that barrier. That's right. And then it was she like opened the door for for all of these women to come in and show them it was okay, and you know, and you yeah. can be this. And then it seems like in the last five years. It has just been insane. It's great, right? Yeah, like it's that's really cool. cool. Snowboarding's one thing, but the skate thing now has been the the wall is completely blown apart. Dope. And it's it's really cool to see. And like you know, some of my favorite skateboarders to watch are women at this point because they just like Nora Vasconcelos has like the best style. Rad. And it's just really cool. And, it, and it's like it's taken a long time to deprogram someone that grew up in the eighties that like, you know, uh, w- girls can't skate. Yeah, totally. You know what I mean? But eventually you do deprogram yourself and all, all you see is raw talent. Well, I don't know if you had this same thing because I feel like we had a similar upbringing. You're in the East Coast. Mm-hmm. You're in New Hampshire. You're kind of, at, like, you're not in some major city. Right? No, no, we were, we were pretty People far. have ramps and, that are out in the bush somewhere. Sure. And uh, if a girl was to show up there, I don't know if you've had this experience. Yeah. I had girlfriends that were like, I want a skateboard. And I'd be like, gladly and mm-hmm. they'd get to the point where they could drop in they do the drop in to like get hurt mm-hmm. and the first time they get really hurt kind of everybody is like oh that was a bad idea yeah and i think like you know at that point in time it was like the skate betty thing skate betty you know totally. and it was like it wasn't even there was just too it was too steep of a hill like mm-hmm. it just culturally mm-hmm. to even climb but there was like um, Blaze Bloom's sister Bonnie was like one of the first skate uh, women that I saw that was like really good, like did inverts and stuff. Rad. And I and and then like Kara Beth shortly thereafter. Yeah. But that was like it. Like there yeah. wasn't. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they were sprinkled here and there, but it was like CB Kara uh, uh, Beth Burnside was like the w- woman in skateboarding that knocked down that wall. Totally. And you know, it's. There wasn't a community. No, they there wasn't. Would, they had to hang out with the guys. And mm-hmm. the guys are kind of ruthless. Like, that was the thing about skating. Dicks. Straight up dicks. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's bad enough that, like, you know, especially back east, and I don't know how this was where you grew up, but, like, 
the older guys, it was full pecking order. And yes. it was like you showed up at the ramp and you were some like 15 year old that they didn't know. You were getting tortured. Tortured. You wouldn't even get to skate. Like you just get snake. They just snake you. So yeah. you'd have to like fight to get your runs. Yeah. You know, and then God forbid you were good. Yeah, because then they would. Yeah, they then would, you're even lamer. You know, like isn't that insane? It's so <laughs> insane, yeah. right? It was definitely where I was from. We didn't have a big enough scene for there to be a pecking order. Mm-hmm. Like we still had like full kook. Right. Like we. So like there was only a few of us that weren't full kook. Right. But um, Sean Kearns talked about C Lynn uh-huh. in the early days in North Vancouver, and it was like. You would get physically assaulted. Yeah, I mean, I've heard all the stories about ceiling where it's like, yeah. you know, you showed up there, and if you weren't part of like the crew, you were like straight up booted out of there get or like out. chased out. Go and some people yeah. just love they love playing that part. Yeah, you know, well, it, it, I think that it it harkens to the well, it's just tribalism, but like my buddy Mike Batello is a, mm-hmm. no, a former North Shore lifeguard. And he had, like, marks on his board for, like, leashes he'd cut. Like, mm-hmm. he would go out at Pipeline and cut some kook's leash. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you cut me off. And then and that was, like, I remember, like, those 80s movies, like, about the hooey and mm-hmm. about, like, going at that North Shore movie. Oh, right? sure. It's crazy. But it, it, like, created this mysticism. Yeah. That, I mean, it still exists in Hawaii. Oh, probably, I think, I think yeah. it's I think it's a, it may be less now, but, like, as far as, like, the group consciousness knows, like, you're, like, shit i go to hawaii like i'm gonna get my there's pecking here. order but it's it kind of in hawaii it makes sense because if you're the dude in the water who's endangering other people i mean pipeline's serious like you get killed there easy. yes yeah so if you're some dude who's putting himself in the wrong place and you're endangering other people you're gonna get told to leave yeah and that's just how it is but like snowboarding and skating were just such like like eh, like snowboarding for sure like full weenie sport like back in the day but like you know <laughs> skating there was only in and, and this is like late 80s early 90s there's only a limited number of ramps and you get like a snake session with one ramp in a three-hour radius and everyone shows up there on a saturday yeah and it's like you know the dudes that built it they want their runs yeah so like you know you're some little kid who comes up from like the other <laughs> town and you're pretty good like yeah, you ain't getting yeah, your runs yeah, in yeah. like you kidding me yeah, I remember going showing up at somebody's yard. Pat Brown had a had a ramp out in Garson, it, and it was like the family's eating dinner, and I'm not asking permission. I've skated it with him before, mm-hmm. and I'm just like, you know, oh, yeah. the, then the family comes out like, "What the hell are you doing?" You're like, "Oh, it's okay. I know Pat." And Pat's like there looking at you, going, oh "Dude, God. seriously, this is a, my family's having dinner. What the fuck are you doing?" Yeah, and it was just from all of that, like from. Being like, look, I'm I'm on a limited time right. thing. Here. I just traveled four <laughs> hours. Like, I, I can't get out here. Every I borrowed the car, and I just and I've and I also kind of wanted to skate by myself. Like, I you want to improve mm-hmm. if you're not that good. You kind of want to improve. Like, like I still do it now. Yeah, on your own park terms. Yeah, early in the morning when nobody's there, I'm not mm-hmm. going to go snake on some kid when mm-hmm. there's like 50 kids in the park. Yeah, but if it's somebody's ramp in their yard. No, I mean, that's no just dice. how it was. And, like, yeah. I try to explain that to, like, some of the younger generation. Like, you know, we would literally have, de- uh, like, uh, directions on a napkin. And, sure. like, and, and you'd pull out the atlas. And you'd be like, okay, well, it's kind of, we know it's in this town, but we don't really know where it is. So we're just going to go to the town and then just drive around till we see kids and ask the kids where yeah. where the big wooden like that's it you totally. is you'd look for if you saw someone on a skateboard you were just like great yeah awesome we got our guy where's the ramp right totally and you have no phone numbers and you would be None. gambling like yeah. is it you know you go knock on the door i'm looking knock on the door. <laughs> like that kind of thing sometimes there'd be a hole in the bottom of the ramp yeah. right it would be they you'd get all the way there and they'd say no it's you know what it's we have to reapply it or whatever and you're mm-hmm. like we could make that work yeah we, we'll just go around it we'll go around we'll put a piece of cardboard or something yeah it's funny that was it? a fun time so my first road trip was well first i went to mount hood mm-hmm. in 1990 or 91 i think for Tim Wendell's camp. Okay. And when I came back, I had a friend who lived in Providence, Rhode Island. No, he lived in New Hampshire or Massachusetts. Where do you live? Amherst. Amherst, okay. But he yeah, took us down to Providence. He's like, we can surf here. We can skate. There's a vert ramp. Like, right. it'll be cool. And that road trip when I was 16, 
changed my life. I'm we drove sure. 17 hours to get down there and we saw Andrew Murphy skate and doing inverts and right. surfed for the first time. And that was it. We were like, that's I'm hooked. Yeah. This is now it's not just skateboarding, snowboarding. We've got surfing now too. And then the road trip thing, mm-hmm. it was the road trip thing was like, yeah, this is more fun than anything you could do. I think that was kind of right around the time. I think I went the first year I went to hood might've been, might've been 1990. And it was like the first, it, it was the first Wendell camp. Yeah. So I went the second year. Okay. So, so Tim, I went th- this was when Tim was like, it was barely a camp. It was <laughs> yeah. like, it was such a shit show. And yeah. I went there actually with Jason Ford. We drove from no Massachusetts way. to Oregon. No way. We stopped in Colorado. And that was like my first, like, uh, I mean, it was the first time I'd ever been to hood. Yeah. And you know, it was just, it was really cool. Yeah. It was super cool to like travel all that way and like go to Colorado. I'd, I've been to Colorado snowboarding the year before for, for Sims, like Sims flew me out there, but sick to, to go there and, and be in Boulder and like, that's what made me fall in love with it was, yeah. was that road trip. And I think, you know, road trips are sick. Road trips are the best. Yeah. I'm on one right now. This yeah. is a road trip. This is so sick. <laughs> yeah. I, I literally went down to Huntington Beach mm-hmm. and I was like, there's red curbs. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm yeah, going to yeah. like try and slap you a red curb. I got to find a nice low, long red curb to slap you before I go home. But there's there's an abundance of them. An here. abundance. Yeah. But I'm I'm skateboarding down that kind of like you know you wouldn't call it a boardwalk because there's no I think boards. they do they do call it the boardwalk yeah. but it's like you yeah know, you're just the cement and I'm like the, I am inside my childhood imagination of what California mm-hmm. is like and it is exactly that it's exactly that my friend um, who actually just left the, the Swedish guy Pierre like his deal is is he he goes around and like when he goes to L A he will go and find all the spots from the old like. Santa Cruz wheels on fire video oh, and rad. like and like the H Street videos and he will take pictures of them and he'll set like send them to me or send them to the friends or put them on yeah. Instagram. He's like, yeah. guess where I am? And it's like the Nottis fire hydrant and like I love you know it. these weird like here's where the wall rides were that yeah. was you know and it or like down in Venice and it, it's so funny because um you know it's that nostalgia like I don't know if that will ever exist again you know oh I don't know I, I think I think that there's there's kids that know about like you know, if you're in Tahoe, there's like the the Jamie Lynn jump, or here's the you know here's the UC jump. It. Like there's yeah. there's like that kind of thing where where people have have like um you know they acknowledge like where these jumps were from. You gotta the be with Corey. Corey yeah, Corey yeah. Corey Altoon is the yeah, he yeah. he'll tell you everything. It's it's great, but I agree with you because you, it's just overwhelmed with yeah. media now. You what are you gonna do? Go where the Cash me outside, go. Yeah, like, totally. I, uh, you know what? They probably do do that. I think that's what it is. <laughs> like, because I've got a kid who's probably a few years older than your kids. Mm-hmm. Definitely, sixteen year old, and I got a twenty year old. Okay. And for the first five years of video YouTube videos, mm-hmm. where, where they're watching other people play video games. Oh, that's the weirdest thing. Ever. My head was like. I was mad at them. Yeah. I was like, you can't do that. Like, why, why don't you just play the game? Like, <laughs> And then you hear the commentary that's going on. And it's like guys that feel to me like our age, yeah. just swearing and playing. Oh, fuck. Get away from me. Oh, my God. I'm like, what are you getting out of this? You're watching someone else shittily play Appar- a video game. Apparently a lot because those guys on YouTube make a shitload of money yeah. doing that. My, my buddy Rob Dow, who does uh, Wired Snowboards. Mm-hmm. He went to one of the houses, uh, the YouTube video house, mm-hmm. got, and he was like, it's off the chain, dude. Like, a snowboarder house, like the ride house mm-hmm. that would have been down here, was, it was... It's so know, weird. It was ghetto, right? Like, yeah. compared to, like, now they're, these, these guys are millionaires. Are, yeah. They're there's, mansions. There's one of them, there's one of these YouTube video gamer guys, his name is uh, Dr. Disrespect, and he lives <laughs> he lives here in Encinitas, and he has a full shtick where he, like, dresses up like a... He wears like a cheesy like mustache and and glass. It's a full thing. Yeah, but he drives around town in a black Lamborghini. Like that's it's they're making yeah. a lot. Like, I mean, it's I can't hate it because these right. guys are killing it. Right, they're yeah. killing it. Well, yeah, that's like Palmer with a with a uh, clown haircut driving mm-hmm. around in a Cadillac. But like we're talking a Ten lot levels yeah, higher. <laughs> yeah, like he was he was like barely scraping by, and mm-hmm. these guys are in Lambos. Really? Yeah, it's nuts. 
It's nuts. Esports so, is crazy, dude. Esports. Yeah. yeah, you you spoke out really. The, again, you informed my opinion on video gaming at the X Games. I was like, that's disrespectful. Well, it's like I understand that esports. So many people play video games. Yeah, and it's like it should be I a get, thing. I get that's it. fine. And they make and they yeah. and the views that of people that uh, watch competitive gaming eclipses the X Games and the Do Tour and by like hundreds of thousands of people so right, i get it it's right, like a thing right, right. but to it felt like a cash grab from the x games oh, yeah to like look yeah. like we have like a guy died like on a snowmobile the year before mm-hmm. and you're gonna give a medal to someone for playing call of duty like i love call of duty just as much as the next guy but like yeah there's no way in hell that i would ever consider yeah. like the best dude on par with like like Palmer or yeah, like Mark yeah, McMorris yeah. or any of these dudes who like can get broke off. Yeah. It's like having a sun tanning competition right. at the ASP or something. It's like, yeah. it just doesn't make sense. But it's, it doesn't make but sense. But it exists in its own. But it exists in its own. Right. That's fine. But I got like, yeah. when I spoke out against that, I got like a, like a lot of hate. Really? And, and those the the esports fans are engaged. Engaged. <laughs> They're That's very so, engaged yeah, on social yeah, media. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, I was yeah. just like <laughs> just like holy crap. Overwhelmed. Like, I don't, these people hate me and they're like they are gonna find what they my have bank account hate. is. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> they have hate. That's the thing, is that they're an outraged society. Yeah. I mean, we were kind of outraged as snowboarder kids, but we're the worst we're gonna do is like break a window yeah. or something we're gonna ride on the side of your building or yeah. something we're but outraged but i think that's what it was not like, it was part it was part of it i'm glad that i get to say this to todd richards because it's pretty <laughs> hilarious but i had a realization last year or two years ago that it's funny i was at a skate park and there were scooter kids mm-hmm. and i might have monologued to a kid I think I did. I monologued to a kid. What does that sign say? It says skate park. Right. right. Okay. Do you understand the, um, the the amount of work that went into us convincing city council to set aside this parcel of property mm-hmm. and the money to build this place? And now here you guys are with your Slurpees and spitting on the ground <laughs> and making a mess and being in everybody's way. And I got home that night and I was like, it's called a ski hill. And I was like, oh, uh, that was us. We were the scooter kids of well, that, skiing. I think that's, I mean, it's such a different time. When I yeah. mean, when I was growing up, it was like skaters hated BMXers. And, yep, and, totally. But it, things... Street skaters hated vert skaters. Yeah, I mean, that, there's all these different things and who used... And, but we could all agree that we all hated rollerbladers. Like every, <laughs> oh, like it didn't matter who, yeah. if you were a skater or BMXer, we united against the common foe. But... um. <laughs> But it, it's so different now, and it's like, look, if if I don't care, it's you're not looking at your phone. Like that's the way I look at it now. Wow, it's, it's yeah, like, that makes get sense. outside, yeah, and move. And you know, it's I don't scooter, but I can like I can understand how that there would be an appeal. Like I'm from the old school, but like my son. You know, he, they don't, there is no difference. They don't care. Yeah, it's like, whatever, my, you know, yeah. he just, this is my bro. The scooter and, thing is easier. So then it means that the kids go more. Right. So Skating's I always, hard. yeah, I always told my kids, look, you can scooter until you're good enough to try skating. Mm-hmm. Then you, then you'll skate. And they got to skating and they're like, this is hard. It's mm-hmm. too, we don't want to go. So if it's a matter of going or not, yeah. you can scooter. That's fine. It's inst- I think it's like, scoot like. I mean, I, I'm completely uninformed on this because, but like scootering kind of seems to me like it's instant gratification. Like totally. you can get it good yep. in two weeks. Yeah. Ha- yeah, yeah, yeah skating, yeah. you, not only do you have to get over the fear of dropping in, which is like the most terrifying thing in the world. It's insane. Like to Ollie, that takes a long time. That you, as a, as a human person that's gotten past a certain age, yeah. you can't learn to Ollie. No. There's a spot. <laughs> you get, you don't have time. Right. You, if you have a full-time job, you're not going to yeah. learn how to Ollie. You don't have the you, determination. It just, it's it just not, missed. Yeah. You missed your opportunity. You need to be a kid. It's got to take you the whole summer mm-hmm. and you got to be dedicated that whole time. And you're just, and you're, you need a carpeted area. Yeah. So maybe that's what it is. And it, yeah. it really comes down to just ease and and um just just having a soft intro into a sport where you can get we're good. the last generation that didn't have the the world padded for us True. you know what i mean that's mm-hmm. what it comes down to is that 
we did it because there was nothing else to do. Had there been phones, we probably all would have sat around on totally, our phones. Totally. That's what it comes down to. And that's another thing, too. I mean, it's like yeah. I try to explain to my kids, like, I would be in another state with three dollars in my pocket my you know the battery's dying in my car and i was happy as a clam like, mm-hmm. and and you know now they're like well i don't have you know i need full tank of gas and my, you know, <laughs> there's this it's just so I'm bored yeah my kid says i'm bored i'm like good you're supposed to be bored yeah, sometimes. make you figure shit out yeah like, go do something else then I don't, know. don't sit on your phone i mean whatever i, I love my kids I think that they're it's pretty good with their phones, different generation, but it's man. like, an, it's a huge engagement with phones mm. thing. Everybody's oh, I, I, in it. I hate them. Yeah, me but too. But it's like, I'm I, on them. I realize it's crack and I yeah. realize that the, yeah. the, it's affecting my brain the same way that like crack would. Oh, it is. You know? Exactly. And it's, and it's, and I can't stop. Yeah. The thing that I learned this week that I was like, wow, no way. Instagram is, they have engineers to... To keep you on there. Yeah, like, that's what totally. they want, right? Mm-hmm. But it's set up like a a um, slot machine. So, like, it could load any part of the information first, like your likes or whatever, but it holds that to the end. So everything loads. You see the first video playing, everything. Yeah. And then, ka-ching, yeah, then you, you, get get, your little, yeah, totally. you get your little coins. Ding, 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 they ding, They know ding. what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. But the thing that that made me realize is it's a three-tiered philosophy, your phone knows more about you than you know about yourself. Mm -hmm. So they have that data and it's important. Like it's important data to you, Mm -hmm. but they're selling it to people who will buy it. And those people are using it to sell you things. So I think with this 5G thing coming, that's gnarly, which is gnarly. Mm -hmm. They're going to know 10 times more. They're going to know at a deep level what really bothers you about yourself well, and, and the, the world. I mean, I just, God, this is a rabbit hole that we could go down. Well, I'm it. just thinking that they're gonna, there's got to be someone who can flip it around and give us that information for the betterment of ourselves. Well, it's Someone's got to do it. You ever see those things where like Instagram will go down for a day? Yeah. And then people will be like, oh my God, productivity <laughs> at our workplace has gone up uh, 150%. <laughs> and it's so it's yeah. so true. Like those days, like any of those days where where maybe I'm somewhere where there's no cell service. Yeah. Or, you know. My friend just came back from 10 days in Indo. It's kind of rad. They're they're like, changed my life. Yeah. I'm like, 10 days without your phone Dude. changed your life? I, probably <laughs> at this you point did. where you're just like, all right, well, here we go. And I, I, I kind of think that it's it's true in some uh, regard. It is. No, it's 100% true. Like they And they know it's true. They're just not telling us, mm-hmm. which is, I mean, here I am going down the you know conspiracy it's not a conspiracy they're just doing it to sell you things yeah, yeah. they're telling you they're doing it yeah. to sell you things yeah but you don't care no yeah. why because the things you buy are better now anyway yeah. i like them more i get more satisfaction <laughs> out of my they're more interactive purchases. they're more in, i'm more engaged <laughs> yeah. with my purchases right but it's and we were talking about the vans thing how they th- how they just became this monolith without having to Deal with all those things that being the biggest often. Well, I kind of think like we like how we were talking before about like, I guess to, to kind of rewind, I was saying that uh, Vans, if you had told me 10 years ago that Vans would be in the position that it's in now, I'd be like, there's no way in hell. No possible way. Because yeah. it was like Vans was kind of like DC was on top and like, God, who else was there? Like, was audio still around? But wh- whatever the case, maybe sure, sure. maybe a little bit further Circa back than that, or whatever. Right, yeah, and, there was... and everyone was doing like the fat, puffy shoes. D threes, sure. Right, and then Vans made theirs, and it was hideous. It was awful. But yeah. it was like weird. Vans just kept doing its thing, stayed in its lane. Yeah, and eventually everyone just like, you know, I- I'll definitely I'll credit like guys like Dylan Reader and like these dudes who just wanted to skate in low tops. Yep, and it changed change the whole thing mm-hmm. yeah the way tony truillo could skate totally. in slip-ons you were like that's not right but there was like but there was a time where yeah. like even trujillo was like he was he was skating in in whatever that like the puffy van was at yeah. that point and yeah. then and then all of a sudden you saw like footage of someone like um jeff roley skating in slip-ons yeah and you're like oh that's weird yeah. Is, is he like yeah. going? To, is he on his yeah. way to dinner and he just kind of yeah. like yeah. tray flip totally. this stair set? And then all of a sudden, it just been it like turned into like, you know, the shoes that I kind of um, associated with like surfer dudes. Yeah, or like you know Jeff Spicoli. Spicoli all, all for of a sudden sure. became. I mean, I've been wearing just the the slip on um, pros for 
years. Me too. I don't want another pair of shoes. And if they're so simple, they're simple and they, and they signal to your tribe like, Hey, this is, this is me. Yeah. I'm that guy. Ease of. Yeah. Yeah. I like to slip my shoes on. Yes. There's some skateboards leaning against the entranceway of my, I'm Mm -hmm. good with that. But it's funny though, because for so many years, I mean, I rode for DC forever. Yeah. And it was, you know, I go through my storage unit and I look at like, I have the old shoes and stuff. I'm like, I wore this. Like it's like it just looks like you're putting it's like you're putting on like a race car like a like a it looks yeah. like a lowered yeah. Honda Civic that you're wearing on your foot. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. so weird. Tell me about the transition from Sims to Morrow because sure. it was you and Brad, right? Like was Brad a big part of that? Uh, well, when happening? I f- when I first got on Sims, this is like back in like 1990, 8990 was 89, when, 90. was when I was really lobbying hard to get. I really wanted to get on Sims, and, and they put me on the team, and I was super stoked, and I was like, yeah, this is sick. I'm living my dream. <laughs> yeah. And then Sims, like Vision Vision Streetwear and Sims were the same brand at that point, and then all of a sudden, there was a big hubbub with uh, Brad Dorfman and Tom Sims, and all of a sudden, Sims was dead, uh, 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 like the way that we knew it. Yeah. And I remember getting this um, email email i got this le- <laughs> i got this letter in the mail yeah. from brad saying we're all we're all gone from sims like we're all no longer going to be a part of that but then i also at the bottom of the letter it was like i'm going to contact you in a little bit i've got something cooking cool you know he's like don't resign with this other with vision sims mm. because if you remember at that point that's when sims there was two sims at the same simultaneously in the marketplace there was tom sims yeah. And there was Vision Sims. They were both simultaneously existing in this. In what was the board era of that? Those... Well, it was like the it the Vision Sims kind of had the same graphics as like the old school, like the half pipe. And, yeah. you know, it was yeah. like that, that, that graphic that Clum, Scott Clum kind of designed. But yeah. it just was like taken like uh, another step forward, a little bit more aggressive. But at, then uh, at the same time... There was this other Sims that was like all of a sudden you had like the Palmer like Cadillac like the early oh, Palmer and then, boards were and coming the, out and the no one nub was on that Sims? right yeah. yeah so it was like yeah. this weird divergence that's weird that is super just for weird. one season yeah, might have yeah, even yeah, been yeah, half yeah. a season until yeah, they got their yeah. shit together but it was weird in the beginning yeah and then um so that's when Brad uh, Brad Stewart called me and he's like um he's like we're doing this thing we're gonna do it with Rob Morrow right. and I had seen Rob ride around on this blaze like the, the initial moral blaze board was like <laughs> dude i don't really like am i is this a smart decision because that board was just like flames on it and flames, it just it just dude. looked so oregon like so sure. 1989 oregon that yep. i was like mini trucker like weird i was like oh god i don't know but then Brad, and you'd been on sims i was which on was, sims and it was uh, like people don't realize how dominant sims was at that moment sure. there was no burton no there, there it didn't exist well there was actually burton was 90, huge but but the sims domination happened like 85 through 88 yeah. if you skated I, yeah. I, the, the way that i look at it is if you skated you wanted to be a part of sims yeah if you kind of grew up like you know I don't know, maybe race, having a racing background or something. Sure. You were more drawn to Burton. Okay. And yeah, it, I, I fought to get on Sims. Like this, yeah. that was the only thing I wanted. Like I wanted to be on Sims with Terry Kidwell and Chris Roach. Like that was all I wanted. Yeah. And I finally get it. And the company takes a shit. And like, <laughs> oh God. So it was, but it was great because Brad was like, look, Tucker Franzen's coming on board. Um, we're going to get, uh, well, Rob's, Rob Morrow's going to be on board and also Noah Brandon. Oh yeah, and I was like, "Whoa, okay, like this. This sounds rad." So it was really cool, and for for the early years, and Shannon Dunn came on uh, came on board a little bit later that first year, but it yeah. was like it was a tight crew, and it was real tight for a while. It I'm was, just we realizing like family. Moro is Sims's um, ride, kind of R- right. Yeah, like you take the you take mm-hmm. the some of the power team from sims and you create a brand new brand yep. with cooler marketing better boards and mm-hmm. and take the riders to the next level and it was at that point in time i mean moro was um like robbie's family like the moro family was they were engineers they were like like crazy aerospace boards, engineers yeah. i mean they were they were a little futuristic for what the marketplace yes. was really ready for yes. at that point like the i mean the spoon came out kind of second year, but like it was all foam construction. Yep. 
um, with carbon and all this stuff. And everyone was just still kind of like hung up on like like horizontal lamb snowboards. Yeah, it kind of happened in, you know, the thing that happened with foam core was happening for those years. Yes. And then, so people would just blanket say, you'd walk into a store that sold snowboards and the salesperson would say, you just don't want a foam board. Right. And so that really hurt those Mora boards. It did. And it hurt Rosie and it was tr- as well. And it was trendy yeah. at that point to bash foam. Totally. And like, I mean, I, I understand like they broke. Yeah. But they, like I'd never broken a board. Not the Mora foam. And not the Rosy foam either. Well, I mean, I, you I, could you could break Rosy foam, you could break Moro foam, but you could break wood boards too. Totally, it but, wasn't like wood was like completely indestructible. But it was a new type of construction, yeah. and and our industry of snowboarding yes. loves to bash oh, whatever bash. is new. Sure, okay. And right. and so I, I was a full convert for the pre cured torsion wrapped foam core Mm -hmm. like it wasn't a squirt into the board it was like they were building a sandwich construction board with a foam core that was that allowed them to have no knots and no fiber Mm -hmm. orientation and a perfect core every time so if you rode one board and you even god forbid you hit a rock and you broke it Mm -hmm. you could get on the uh, uh, another production board it's the exact board and that was what i really liked is because i at that point i really liked to ride soft boards yeah and i just tell robbie yeah just i want this one this this uh, like flex and at that point it was that wasn't that wasn't even available nobody in, had in the industry yeah you know and it was also like this was the first time i'd ever rode basically centered stance boards yeah like twins yeah um which was weird and i think the first twin that i ever rode was this board that tucker friends and developed with robbie called it was the rem it was the rotated ellipse model so it was yeah. like it was an almost kind of a an early asymmetrical yeah. or rotated side cut rotated basically yeah. your heel edge was deeper than your toe edge yep so i mean there were so many and like the, then the next year the moro spoon came out and that thing when it first came out was like what like yeah. you were either on board or you're yeah. like this thing is this whack we were in we were in because jibbing was on yeah. fire at that point and it, it was just made cool sense it, they were hard to get they mm-hmm. were rare that was the thing was you could get a burton board at any you know sport check or whatever at mm-hmm. that point but a moro spoon that meant you were deep yeah. you you were committed and you had that year's board when that was that year's board Oh man, yeah. and Br- Noah Brandon, you. There were so many people that put that board on the map. Jana too. I yeah, think. Jana. Jana yeah. was a. Li- Jana came on a little bit later. Um, I think she got on in like ninety three, maybe. It was like two, like two years later. But like yeah. Billy Anderson was on Billy at that Anderson, point. Billy Anderson. Um, it it was such a a time in snowboarding where there was leap like leaps in in technology every and year every, every year, year was something yeah. crazy and it was i mean moral like a, two years after that came out with the lunch tray oh yeah remember that thing tray. so it was like and you know and tray. it's it was like a a, th- a 135 with the effective edge of at that point the effective edge of like a 160 yeah. or, or something yeah. crazy yeah it was and it yeah. was i remember I was just like, wow. Like, I, I wasn't on board with yeah. the lunch tray. I'm like, no. this thing is just ridiculous. That was like taking it too, too far. But that was yeah. like... But it was happening. Yeah. And then... Your board... Okay, what was the first board that you did with them? Because that was where you got your first pro model. Yeah, it was where I got my first pro model. So I was riding the, the Revert. The Revert, the Revert was yep. like their freestyle, like their twin yep. freestyle board, low profile nose. And that was... I rode a 54 Revert for like two seasons. Yeah. And so they were like, okay, you want to, you know... Finally, I finally get a pro model because you know everyone and their grandmother had a pro model. At that sure, point. that's not why though, Todd. Yeah. You were yeah. winning. Well, everything. That, that was. I mean, they gave Moro made me earn it. They're like, yeah. we're not just going to give you one. You have to. It, it was. It was such a weird comment. Like Mickey Keller was the team manager at that point, and she was. And I'm like, when can I get a pro model? And she's like, when you win the U.S. Open. Right. So I was like, right. fuck you. I'm going to win the U.S. Open. Nice. So in '94. I won the open, and I remember calling her after, being like, "I won the open, so when do, when do I get my board?" And the, it, you know, they held, they went to their, you know, came through with their word. And I remember I went into Morrow and designed. It was just, it was the same. I didn't want a different board, right? They're like, "What do you want to design?" I'm like, "I want to keep riding this board I'm riding." 
uh, I'm going to draw this thing. And I remember I drew, I drew something in like, I don't know, probably April and Scott Clum tweaked it on his computer and like, to, you know, made it really cool. And it was that dinosaur. Oh yeah. And then I remember yeah. they, they handed that to me, um, in like end of July at hood that summer. Yeah. And, and I was just like, Oh my God. And then I went to New Zealand like the next day. Like I got that board, went to New Zealand the next day. And I, so hyped. Yeah, I was so hyped. Yeah, that's so awesome. hyped. Yeah, that's an iconic graphic, dude. I'm stoked. I'm trying yeah. to find someone like, you know, I'm, I get boards from Yes now and I'm, yeah. And like, and their boards are made by Nidecker and I'm trying to find the original file. Ooh. I'm yeah. like, I just That'd want you dope. to, I don't need, I don't want to sell them. I just yeah. want, I want some of them. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. I just want to have a shape that I like now. Yeah. And we just do the dinosaur graphic. Is the yes thing a Warburton connection? Yes, it is. Yeah, that guy, oh, and, that guy's and I forget amazing. Alex was on Moro yeah, he, too in the and very beginning. And he was crushing. I yeah. remember the first when Moro couldn't afford full page ads, and they were still doing half yeah. page or quarters. Sure, that there was some. I don't know how they fit him in a quarter page because he's so tall. <laughs> yeah, I know. Riding these I, long. I boards. forget though. Like, and yeah, Alex was definitely. He was. Um, he was. Like one of those engine, like nerdy snowboarders, like yes. would really like Noah Brandon was the same way, like cool. they, like, and I was kind of like, yeah, whatever, like, yeah, you know, it's can is soft, cool, like <laughs> yeah. you know. But those guys were really in there with like the um with Neil Morrow was Robbie's cousin, and he was like the super engineer, yeah. And they would sit down and they would you know they would really hammer out these things on like very rudimentary CAD programs back right. in the day, right? And Alex was like, I mean. He was he was instrumental in in the direction of of Morrow back then as far as technical boards and I mean he's doing the same thing he's with still yes. doing the exact same thing I, which I, is rad. I texted him a couple, like last year or the year before last because they came out with their yes has this underbite thing which basically looked like when you look at the side cut you're like I think the board's broken like it like <laughs> did this thing get pressed wrong and it was it's like the side cut comes in like a traditional side cut and then like like it almost like stair steps down into this tighter side cut and then stair Weird. steps out again where your where your back foot would be and I remember getting that board for the first time being like someone said to me like dude what's up with your rails <laughs> yeah I was like whoa like what is that and I remember and I was kind of like well, this is weird and then I took one run on it, and I was like, "This thing carves like a race board." Amazing. And but at the same time, it's like a really good freestyle board, and and it's all Alex's weird, mad scientist. Yeah, he's 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 one of those guys that I went up to in Whistler. I, I was like, "Alex," mm-hmm. and he was like, "Hey, like you must know me if right. you know my name." I'm like, "I'm a huge fan," and he was like, "Ah, fuck off." He didn't say fuck off, but he was right, like, yeah, "You got to be dismissal. shitting me." I haven't been a pro snowboarder for 20 years. What are you talking about? Right. He, he was really nice, but he was really like, it's, it's, I can't believe that just happened. I'm it's like, cool, no, he's, though. He's an incredibly prolific. Actually, he's probably one of the most underrated Canadian pros because mm-hmm. he didn't, he wasn't a media whore mm-hmm. in any way, but he was really good. Yeah, People, he f- like yeah. flew under the radar. And I just yeah. remember him and like all those, there was probably like, Actually, it was almost every single person that was from Canada all had those the snowboard shop oh, gloves. Yeah. Remember those gloves, oh, the yeah. red, the yeah. gauntlet gloves. Yeah. They all had yeah. those gloves, and we wanted those gloves so bad. That all was those dudes that, had them. That was the generation before mine. Everybody had to have those. By the time I moved to Whistler, everyone had to have West Beach stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the big West Beach, the like, big like, West Beach, the Kevin, like Young, Kevin Young pants, Devin Walsh giant. Those were, I mean, clown pants, and it was weird though. <laughs> That like there was a point in time where everyone was like, "Damn, I think I need to get those pants." I uh, this is the funniest thing is I saw someone posted an Instagram clip of probably Kevin from Project Six. It might even yeah, be Project yeah, yeah, Six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Riding his, the pipe, and his pants are so fucking big it's ridiculous. But when I see when I saw that, my brain still remembers when that was as cool as it could be, yeah. and I was like, "That looks so good." Yeah. But when you and then you snap back into reality, and you're like, it looks so it kooky. Full raver what pants. Is that? And it's like you know, you forget. Um, I'm gonna turn the light on real quick. Yeah, so. sure, sure. Um, yeah. Hold on a sec. Okay, this is this is great. <laughs> yeah, this is fun, dude. I knew it would be. Yeah, the snowboard shop gloves were the the thing is, I, I was at a competing shop. Uh huh. So at the competing shop, we couldn't have West Beach because that was the oh, shop. Oh, West Beach was a shop. Okay, yeah. Yeah, West Beach was a shop as That's well right. as a, a thing. That. And then uh, 
the snowboard shop was also a shop. Mm-hmm. Like, so you never wear snowboard shop stuff if you're mm-hmm. working at the boardroom. You know what I mean? Right. But now it's, anyways, yeah, looking back. I wish I had those. I wish I had all that stuff. Just I, like to have, still like just yeah. to have. I mean, yeah. it's like you, it's like you watch the old like H three or not H three. It was more like plan B video where everyone's riding like bearing cover wheels, bearing covers. Yeah. And it's like, you would never ride that. And fat pants. And features <laughs> pants, but everyone's like ripping and you're like, you're like, whoa, I, I should, I mean, these don't make any sense. So that was 94. Them. And I know that because milk, which is Mossberg's mm-hmm. movie from 94. When I did the interview with him, I went and I watched that mm-hmm. and Hasoy went through yeah. a small wheel period. I think everyone did. And and you see Hasoy with big pants and small wheels being Hasoy, mm-hmm. and you're like, whoa, who was that? There was that guy ripped. Who? And then you're like, oh my god, Hasoy. So did it. weird. It's Isn't so it weird, weird how like one one or two people can so uh, influence a generation to make the worst decisions? The worst decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's always been human <laughs> nature. That's it's, every, it, everything good and everything bad has been influenced at some point by one yeah. creative thinker. I can tell you, right, I mean, this is, we'll bring it just into modern times and sure. do a little shit talking. Um, <laughs> there's um, there's this weird trend in snowboarding right now that I can't stand because I come from the school of snowboarding that, that you know, I did, but it's like this weird, like, when you land, you just spin around on the hill. Like you just like, you know, you land, you come off a rail and then you do like 10, three sixties on the hill. And okay. Like, and like, instead of like, uh, like instead of going over the rail, you like slide under the rail. And it's like this weird, like, I feel like I should be listening to the Benny Hill theme. Like, <laughs> like while I'm watching it, like a circus theme while I'm yeah. watching this happen. Like I came from a, a time where like Roach and Kidwell and like, you know, just if you're going to, you know, Everything has to be styled out, not mm-hmm. look like hot garbage like going down the hill. <laughs> and it's and I'm I watch it and it seems like the the pebble is thrown into the pond in Utah more than any place now and you watch the ripples come out and it's it's gross. It's like making this weird gross <laughs> style. I mean, who am I? I'm just an old fart who's like, you know, but I've I been, hear you. I've been through it, but it's yeah. it's like I can't stand <laughs> to watch that Willie from Bluebird said if you cup your if you put your arms under your fucking legs and when you're doing a flip oh my god you're dead to me yeah yeah he hates it and he it's like and it. it's like there's like you know you there was a trend where you rolled your snowboard pants above your boots yeah. and I'm just like stop don't like I yeah. didn't have <laughs> wet f- fucking boots for like 20 years so you assholes can go and roll your pants above your above your boots like i yeah. actually yeah. suffered so yeah. that we could yeah. fix pants so that this wouldn't be a thing and now you want to roll the pant above it. your leg Ugh. that's incredible we're old i know but did you ever cut your board down yeah, we cut our boards down. Well, there for you sure. go. That somebody saw that and when they were like, "We designed the that joyride to, guys." Oh my! Oh yeah, yeah. Ken, the, Ken, the, and yeah. Oh yeah, those guys would have hated that. The joyride guys. But their noses were too long. Yeah, they were actually. And that's really too what long. it was, and, yeah. and I, I really attribute that that to like, you know, Dale Rayburg and and all the all the Midwest. Rowan, uh, yeah, yeah, they yeah. were the first dudes who were like, "These noses are too big." Matt, Donahue, I want less damn. swing weight. I want this yeah. board to be more, and that changed. For, I think for the better. Yeah, but I there agree. was definitely probably at one point, you know, like everyone. I mean, the lunch tray went yeah, too far. Yeah, it went too far, right? Is that what you were going to say? It's yeah, like I was it, just going to say like you you can go drastically in the wrong direction, yeah. or or the guys in Tahoe like Corey and all these dudes that were and you know and Farmer and Palmer like what are these fucking stupid dudes cutting their boards down, and then next thing you know, <laughs> the next year there's there's Palmer on a cut down nose board. It's, and it's true, like, right? You can talk shit until all of a sudden you're like. You find yourself riding the small wheels. You find yourself, <laughs> you, you know, do. That's you know, the crazy thing. skating in slip-ons, and hopefully, oh it's just a, hopefully it influences the generation. I've done to that be with. Better. I've done that with with language. With like when you first hear something, I can remember it was in New Hampshire mm. that uh, or in Massachusetts it's, that someone said uh, uh, "sweet" for the first time, as it like ah that was sweet, and I was like it really to my ear sounded like. Something you would say about like a puppy or right. a girl. Oh, she's a sweet girl or whatever. Mm-hmm. But they were saying it as like, that's rad or whatever. Even the word rad. Yeah. Like I can remember adopting it 
as a again just as social uh, you know like reaching out to the tribe like oh i'm i'm a rad dude like yeah. but you hear a parent say it and you're like that's not it that's is not it. how weird is that now we're like I'm like as far as my parent, uh, my kids are concerned. Yeah, I'm about as square as you can be. <laughs> like, dad is a nerd. Like anything that dad's into. Like, dad's dad's not into hip hop. Dad listens to weird like old punk rock music. <laughs> yeah, and like, yeah. you're a geek. You don't even know. Like, <laughs> you, you, it's like everything that I'm into is just dumb. Well, Paladini was pointing out in one some TED Talk type thing that mm-hmm. I w- was watching that this is. Now you're wearing the same shoes your kids are wearing. Sure. When we were kids, whatever our parents were wearing, we were like, I'll have the opposite of right. that. Right. And that's, I think that's what's happening too. That's why, you know, to bring this around to snowboarding, I think that's why a lot of people are skiing. Sure. Sure. Is skiing, skiing, do you need to take that? You no, take I'm just going to, I'm just going to inform people I am in <laughs> the garage. Doing a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> when I was uh, down in Mount Hood a few years ago, there was a there was a ski build that they did on the on the park, and so that everything had woo yep. and it, they were bigger, yeah. and it kind of ruined it for me. But I, I personally, like, it, I wasn't able to go and enjoy the public park like I normally would. Mm-hmm. But seeing the posse of dudes that skied hitting it the way it was supposed to be hit and everyone in a train so close that Mm -hmm. like, and they're flipping. And if the guy was to explode, that train would be a mess of people. Right. I just, all of a sudden that became cool to me. I was like, okay, I see what cool is now. Mm -hmm. Cool is like your friends. It's always been the same thing. It's a road trip with your buddies, Mm -hmm. enjoying some sport outdoors that you're good at. I think it's awesome. Something that changed for me too is like, instead of looking at the activity, I started to look at like how gnarly it is Mm. and like Mm -hmm. even even bring this back to scooters like uh, this kid R. Willie that I I know because I do Nitro World Game stuff and he's he's arguably the gnarliest scooter kid on the planet and he's gnarly like he does (laughs) like does gnarly stuff and he actually he's he switched from from using doing scooter stuff over to BMX and he like revolutionized what was possible on a, on a BMX bike off because cool. of and you know of course the BMX dudes the core dudes hate him of course can't stand him but like yeah. you know in in my brain I've gone in this direction where like I don't care if you ski because skiers are freaking gnarly, gnarly and they go way bigger than snowboarders Definitely. and and I, I don't care if you're a BMXer are you, you how gnarly is it yeah like I don't care yeah. It, yeah. it's, how it, cool is it to see Matt Hoffman still be a Mexican dude, right to this day? Hoffman is the shit. So Hoffman is the godfather of all action sports all as it. far as I'm concerned. Mega ramp, all, everything, everything. Going big is, it, I think it all Started roads to lead back to Matt Hoffman. Yeah, we, we, we agree on that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, I, when I was a little kid, my mom made me go to church. And in the United Church that I went to, you can get confirmed at 16 or mm-hmm, whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then they they tell you like now you're an adult member of the church and uh, you you're not here as a guest of your parents or mm-hmm, whatever mm-hmm. and I was like great okay well then I'm never coming back thank you very much <laughs> but at at the, my confirmation we had to do a presentation on someone that inspired us and I did Matt Hoffman that's right I wasn't even a BMXer at the time I was still skating and into snowboarding mm-hmm. but Matt Hoffman was just a mind Dude, the, blowing individual the, when, when that quarter pipe picture came out and I think actually Thrasher put it in the magazine because I remember there was no reason for me to see no that. hands and no thing, or it was, was it? the court it was the giant quarter pipe the giant quarter he pipe. went like yeah. you know he went like 35 oh, yeah. feet yeah. high yeah it was insane and, yeah and yeah. I just I there was no reason for me to see that because I wasn't following BMX right but, but right somehow I saw it and yeah. I was just like dude this is like the the most mental like I can't even comprehend yeah no it was it, it was you were putting the two and two together that Oh, if you build a bigger ramp, yeah. you can go bigger. But is there an end to that? Like, could you just build an even bigger, bigger ramp? And that's a Danny Way question. <laughs> and, and and it's like you look at you look at Matt Hoffman, who directly influenced Danny Way, yeah, and what he wanted to do with Mega Ramp, and yep. and and then also to some regard the twenty two foot deep super pipe. Yep. And then that was all influenced right. by it's the same by, principle. It's, it's like, you know, we just make a bigger transition and yep. what's the rule of thumb? You can go as high as the transition is big. Yep. Let's just keep going. And it's it's I, mental. I'll tell you what, like, you know, 
riding half pipe for a living for a long time. And that was like when I kind of like stepped away from riding pipe competitively. It was like 18 feet deep. And I was like, I remember. I was like, okay, this is good. Like 18 feet's cool. And then I remember getting in a 22 foot deep super pipe, which was right around the the 2006 Olympics, 2005, 2006 is when the mega, the mega zog or whatever the hell the machine was. Yeah. And I got in that thing and that extra like four feet, it might as well have been like an eternity. I was like, what the hell? Like, the, <laughs> like you think you're at the lip and you're not even at the lip and then you don't, you wouldn't pop anymore. Cause I mean, we grew up in that, that time where you pop off the lip. Oh you yeah. Up. If you pop in a 22 foot deep super pipe, you're falling out of a building. So far. Yeah. I did exactly that. I mean, I'm not 20 feet out. Mm-hmm. I remember being two or three feet out of the 22 foot deep 2010 pipe. Yeah. Cause that was my, that's my home mountain sure. in Cyprus. So, and I don't, I remember saying to myself, you can't pop. Yeah. So I didn't think I did, but even just coming out an yeah, inch or fall. two, you just fall so far. And it took a long time for me to figure out that, you know, it's, you don't want a soft board in there. You want basically uh, a race board. Right. Because you want to hold the line. Right. And you want to set your edge and you just want to fly out the top. It's a different, just it's whoosh, a completely different thing. Fly out the top. I never just, got it. Yeah. I never got it. I never got to the point where I did anything other than airs inside the thing. Yeah. And, and air inside a 22 foot half pipe feels like you're blasting. Yeah. But you're, it's, it's such a different thing. And, and I was, Really didn't like half pipe for a long time because of my experience. Like I think I, you know, I was just like, okay, I'm over this. I, I can't play in here anymore. And that's well, that uh, happens to most pros, but they don't have. But it was you had like a 20 year career, so right? But it good. was a bummer though because yeah. I really wanted to ride half pipe still, and yeah. I was like, well, could, this is it now. Like if this is, <laughs> I don't even. This sucks. You right. Stole <laughs> right. And then people started to make smaller pipes again. It was like it started to be trendy for be fun for ski resorts to put in. Like Shannon a, Dunn asked that when when I left, she's like, "Can you get a fourteen foot pipe made somewhere, please?" They have them. <laughs> uh, Boreal Boreal in California has one, and then, I saw them and then, building um, it. Yeah, Park City has one, and cool. So it's it's a trending thing because, and it kind of goes to how do you get kids to like ride pipe? Yeah, when all you have to offer is this giant monstrosity that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and dedicated snowmaking that you're pulling yeah. away from the rest of the hill so four people can ride it. How many How many mega ramp concrete parks totally. are there? None. None. And there's because, a reason. Yeah, exactly. But it's exactly. like, but, you know, I think that, I think that the ski resorts are realizing that, you know, half pipe is something that is shown at the Olympics. What would you, what would be your height? What would you What would you I, I pick? Think, I think I would do like a sixteen or seventeen foot deep half pipe. I'd, I'd do like foot deep half eleven. Pipe. I'd do yeah. like twelve. That's I, it, so much fun. They had that at at uh, Mount Hood Meadows mm-hmm. like five ten years ago, and I was like, this everybody can enjoy. Well, this. perfect transition. A yeah. twelve foot perfect transition is a game changer. It's perfect. But yeah. the the yeah. thing is, is like you know, you get to these you get these kids that that see snowboarding in the Olympics, and then they I want to learn how to ride a half pipe. Well, sorry, son. There's only three resorts in the United yeah, States that have yeah. it because it costs so much money to build it and then to maintain it. And then isn't Park City building a mini super pipe, yes. like a three hitter, yeah. right? Like so, you get t- you get three hits. That's that'll be that's at the Woodward in Park City. But it's you know, what do you think of this Woodward thing? It's insane. I, I've been you know I'm on the inside of it, helping yeah. to develop it. Good. And, it's awesome. I see it. I, they just bought a mountain up. There's one of the interior mountains mm-hmm. in BC that's just got purchased by Powder Powder right Powder Corp. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, as soon as I saw Park City, so I'd just been at Boreal, mm-hmm. and I checked out Woodward's, and I was like, I get it. Yeah. And then I went to Park City, and I was like, Next. Oh level. my God, these guys are going to just take over every Olympic action sport it's it's just cool training it's you know we the way that like uh gunny from spt he's he's kind of heading up and there's a a really talented team jeremy jones uh utah jibbing jeremy jones is is in on it too and you know we look at it as um the member dc mountain lab yeah like what ken had at his house actually fairly close to to that facility yeah it's that on steroids it's the ultimate clubhouse like you have you can go up on the hill and you can ride jumps. It's not a very long, but it's a, it's a tight, concise park, and there's all kinds of different options. There's something for everybody, 
and then you go inside and you have a perfect concrete park and then it's there's unbelievable. there's like a rail a skate rail into a foam pit and then the exact same skate rail onto a resi and then that exact same skate rail onto concrete so it's like the the amount of learning that you can do yeah, yeah. i'm insanely jealous that kids get this me too now, you know? yeah it's and crazy it's, and and the funny part of it is Kids get this now, but they'd rather be on their phones. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's going to be parents like you and me dragging kids to this facility where you're like, you could learn this, though. Mm-hmm. There's like, you can learn it on foam. Just do dad a favor. Learn it on foam. Yeah. Just on foam. And then the kids looking at you like, no, because I know the next thing I'm going to have to learn it on a resi. Mm-hmm. Forget it. Yeah. I, I saw in parks, no, in, uh, the boreal mm-hmm. woodwards for the first time the roller skis mm-hmm. and i was like oh do it's they crazy. have do they have that for snowboarding and the guy's like yeah they got roller totally too. Way, yeah. and i was like oh my god that's such a game changer yeah. if you could learn yeah it's a game changer yeah, it's, anyways it's it's skateboarding that's future. everything like yeah. we we went and did peace park there was held at boreal and yeah Danny Davis came up with all these crazy challenges to do when you're off the hill like because mm-hmm. you know there'd be the downtime and would be inside the bunker you know, playing around he's like double backflip on a on a bmx bike and du- yeah. backflip on a beach cruise like all these crazy back things that, that he thought he was just yeah. pulling out of this yeah the, the yeah. air like back double backflip on roller skis thinking yeah. that no one would do it dude they did him all that's and crazy it, people that have never even backflipped a bike exactly learned how to double backflip a bike yes one guy learned how to backflip a, a bmx bike onto the resi He'd never even jumped a BMX bike. And within like <laughs> two days, he was backflipping a BMX bike right. off like a jump. Which for us, when you saw Rad, that was the end of the movie right. on that. That was the end yeah. of the... And it was a fantasy movie. Now like it, it wasn't real. it takes 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So it's, Oh my God. That's dude. just where we are. Yeah, and, that's and where we're at. Like doubles. That's what I was saying is that I kind of... Where I stopped progressing, like I said, I was, mm-hmm. wanted to be a big jump guy. But 90 rolls came in, and I was like, I just, come on. I just learned Misty Flips. Like, how? Yeah. I can cork, but I can't. That doesn't even look oh, I'm, right. I remember, what is that? like, trying yeah. that one summer where, where Peter debuted the backside rodeo or the 90 roll or whatever yeah. you wanted to yeah. call it at that point. Yeah. Well, the way he does it, it's a. We, we yeah. could not figure out how to do it. It doesn't make sense. And then Chris Inglesman was like, well, yeah, you just ride up the jump and just turn 90 and catch your edge going off the <laughs> exactly. jump. We were like getting mangled, mangled trying to learn it. That's I sat at Seymour doing that and there are a few people that got it. Corey from Invasion got it and and Sansalone San got do it. it. Switch. Yeah. He couldn't do it the right way. He got it switch and then he took that switch rodeo to West Beach Classic mm-hmm. Big Air and the X Games and he won. Mm-hmm. He won medals. Yeah, like yeah. it was like, and but I was I was just like, see you later. That's it. But having seen the Woodward Parks, I'm like, yeah, you can. I could learn a ninety yeah. roll. Like, I bet I could learn a ninety roll. Is it, is it too late to is get it too to late? Like, I'm almost fifty. Can I learn a ninety roll at fifty? I'm gonna try. I, why not? Yeah. I mean, back to like when we were younger, it was you had the magazines and you would see like a picture of someone upside down or sequential. Yeah, and I mean, sequentials don't lend you all the tools you need to learn something, but it didn't stop us from trying to like. Well, all I need to do is get my body in that position in the air, <laughs> yeah. and then I'll just figure yeah. out the rest of it later. <laughs> Hope that yeah. the rest comes around. And it was always so so crazy that that was. Well, that's how J- I just talked to Jeff Davis, and mm-hmm. that's how the Crippler came about. Was that he was just trying to learn J tears, mm-hmm. which is how the J tear came about. Was that Jacoby was just trying to learn backflips? Back yeah. And then they forced him to put his hand down. And that was it. Yeah, and that was that. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that Jeff Davis invented the Crippler. How cool is that? You know all these trick names. Mm-hmm. I don't even know the trick names. for. I mean, I know my grabs. Terry got what me did... to say frontside Indy, and then he went, ah! Yeah, of course and he did. So, uh, <laughs> it was like, I know there's no such thing. What? So when you talk to Davis about the Crippler, just like, what, is, what does he think now? I mean, this is... We we say you know it's cri- crippler double crippler like whatever it's like does he realize that it's still in the lexicon? And Somebody like, at the okay during the Olympics in Salt Lake City, were you announcing? No, whoever was the announcer, somebody did a crippler at the Olympics, and they they called out just De- Jeff Davis and said that move was invented here by our hometown oh, hero Jeff cool. Davis. 
I think also in the same way, I talked to Jacoby about it. Jacoby's like, yeah, we were there at the beginning and we, those inverted moves, we pushed back against the rules. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. it led to what it is now, but I wasn't directly a part of it. He, whereas I think with the Crippler, I think he feels like he's still connected. To I mean, it. there's, there's, it's, it's cool to like be synonymous. Yeah. You got my, Mike McGill right here. Yeah. Like, McGill. oh my God. But it's, it's crazy. Like you think about like, Jacoby and then Davis and then you know I I I put Peter Line with the backside rodeo yeah then um which Mike, he calls a switch cork no a backside cork nine wait backside rodeo yeah yeah just backside five forty off yeah. axis and then like yeah. you know um Michael Chuck with oh. the with the Michael Chuck oh my and there's, god I mean, yeah. but it's it's I that doesn't really happen anymore in the sport. Like there's no, well, how could it? There's yeah. just nowhere for it to get. Like, do you want the quad cork named after you? Probably not. No, probably not. I but don't it's, know. It's Maybe just, you do. It's just funny that, 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 yeah, that won't really happen anymore. Well, so neither will Palmer. You know what I mean? Like, like that, I, like to have a person like to that, to have a person that's the closest that guy. we have to Palmer is like Haldor Helgeson. Okay. You, you just schooled <laughs> me there. That's true. Haldor is, is a modern day Palmer as far as like he can the do, craziness. He can do whatever he wants, mm-hmm. first of all. And second of all, he looks the way that he wants. He mm-hmm. just fuck it, I don't care. Palmer is just this one anomaly of a guy though that yeah, even in snowboarding he won't be re- he's like a James Dean character. Right. You know, it's right. it's mythical. He and... won't be repeated because you you nobody could do what he did. Right. Nobody. Like you had to compete against him, mm-hmm. right? What, how not so is that? It was, I mean, in the beginning, Palmer was just the epitome of style. And, yep. and as the sport progressed and when I kind of came on the scene, like, Palm was still in it, but you could tell that it was like the sport, the technicality of the sport was was catching up with him. Yeah. And he didn't yeah. really have any yeah. interest in, like, learning how to do... I mean, he, you know, he definitely put an effort in, but that's when, like, Brushy was on the scene and, like, there was just different stuff and i don't think palm wanted to fit inside that box where he was like you know being forced to do some flippy floppy you right know, you know right quote unquote, right 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 you know, stuff that he didn't palm wanted to do it his way yeah and that's you know luckily for palmer he found snowboard cross yeah in in that zone because palm was all about going fast and he was a racer and it still went huge he invented and, he invented snowboard yeah, cross pretty much he said that he invented it over in france when he was visiting glenn plake and he's like and those fucking swatch guys stole it from me <laughs> <laughs> and i i don't doubt that i don't doubt it at all because he was that motocross mm-hmm. guy and i mean he went and competed in motocross as a fucking pro and and oh you, you can't forget God. that palmer competed in skier cross skier cross yeah, and, and snowboard cross, yeah, and, and he mountain won. biking, and he fucking and, won. Yeah, that's when I talked to him. I said, "You've got a reputation as like a world class shit talker," and he's like, "Yeah," and I'm like, "But you won." He's like, "You shouldn't be allowed to shit talk unless you could win. <laughs> Why would you ever shit talk if you he couldn't was gnarly. win?" And like he was you know, gnarly. Palmer shit talking influenced like Terry. Yeah, like Terry picked up on a yep. lot of his shit talking from from observing Palmer. Oh, of and course. And Palmer's he did. antics yeah. in the start gate with other human beings. Like that was Yeah. You know, Palmer would come up as you're about to drop in, like it's the most tense moment of your life and he'd come up and undo your binding or something <laughs> like that. As you're about to drop in and just or like yeah. just scream at you on the first hit, like, eh, fucking fall. Like, you oh know, like my God. he was ruthless. Yeah. Yeah. He told me that Jimmy Scott would do shit like that to him or like psychologically like look him in the eyes you're gonna fall who palmer fall no oh jimmy would do that to palm oh yeah and (laughs) okay here's the this is the greatest jimmy scott like harassment story ever so you know jimmy had been handing it out for years to people like kind of like humble brag put you down like you know it's fucking weird and then terry (laughs) came on the scene and i remember this one time at the u.s open jimmy's in the start gate and Terrier's like, this is when Terrier was like big dick swinging. Like, it's fucking Terrier. <laughs> yeah. More, yeah. Like, the he, he, like, he's going to, you know, there's Terrier's going to win. Yeah. And and Jimmy's about to drop in, and Terrier walks up to the start gate and goes, Oh, who, who, Jimmy, I uh, just want to tell you right after your run, I'm going to do the same run, but five feet bigger. <laughs> And like, <laughs> and like, then it was like, Go. And Jimmy like drops in, <laughs> and we were just like, Oh my God. Like, and it was good because Jimmy was like, they would give Jimmy 
like at the lip Jimmy. Like Jimmy Jimmy yeah. did a million tricks, but they yeah. were all you know, and then Terry would come in and go like, you know, ten, twelve feet higher than yeah. than was like He really... would do four big hits or whatever. Totally. But that hits. was just yeah. like the epitome of like Palmer influencing the shit talking that yep. Terry was yeah. doing. And it was all like smart psychological <laughs> yeah. warfare and would would Craig ever do any of that stuff? Never, right? No, Craig Craig would fuck with you. Would he? Yeah. Oh, I love this. But this is like this is I mean, I only really I competed with Craig for like two maybe three years. Yeah. And then the TDK years were yeah. Craig's years, and right? And Craig, you were there. Craig stepped away from it, but when it wasn't so like in your face, like like Palmer would be, Craig would just like subtly like fill your boots up with ketchup or something <laughs> like that, and like blame it on somebody else. It wasn't like he was. I mean, Craig was. Craig was just as much of a shit stir as anybody else. Yeah, oh, but yeah. like I didn't ride for Burton, so I didn't get it. But like if you talk to Jason Ford and those guys about how like Craig would mess with people. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> I'm sure and I'm sure Craig messed with um I'm sure Craig really messed with with Terrier when Terrier came out. I remember the first the first event that we ever met Terrier. Um he showed up at the Burton US Open with this other Norwegian woman pipe writer, a shield loftus. Yeah. And it was Terrier was just like Terrier was like her ward at that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, at that event, and then we were all like, uh, "Who's this kid?" And then the next event was the TDK World Championships at Breckenridge, and that's when Terrier like went from being like, "Who's this kid?" to like, "Holy shit!" He was dude. third or something. At yeah, that, he got right? third at that. Yeah, yeah. It um, was like Craig, and then you know, Craig Palm, oh, and then, Palmer, and, and then Terrier. Terrier. Oh god, yeah. That's nuts. All that happened in one in one like year. Like one year. And then yeah. the next year after that, it was like Terry was on the map. That was it. Yeah. Barely spoke any English. Yeah. At he all. said his first trip that he came over, he uh he almost got denied because he didn't know he he was he was that kid that mm-hmm. just he got off the plane and they're like, Where's your passport? And it got to the point where they were like, Fuck, do we have to call security? Like, where's your passport? Right. And he's like, I don't speak English. Yeah, that was, yeah. I mean, pretty much like he didn't speak any, yeah, barely any English. Yeah. That you guys had a pretty rivalrous. We did, thing. Later, but it was like it was more of a rival that was made up by other people. Like I didn't, Good. I didn't, yeah. I didn't really care. Yeah, and I don't think Terry really cared no. either. I no, mean, it was obviously like, not. You know, he pushed me to ride my best. Yeah, and you need that. That's totally the thing. You need, need that. that. You're one of the you're one of the only guys that ever beat him when he was like gloves on Terrier. Yeah, I mean it's like it was just a different it was a different time when there mm-hmm. were, there really were rivalries and and yeah. the magazines played into it and, yeah. and the Skiing media and played into it and, and all that it shit. was all yeah. about rivalries yeah. at yeah. that point. It and was Tom versus Jay. Like, totally, it was like healthy competition. Yeah, and sure. that's and that's what it was. It was like yeah. Moro played me against Burton. It, sure. it, it had nothing sure, to do sure, with sure. me and Terrier, but yeah. it was Moro against yeah. Burton. Yeah, 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 and yeah. Like, you know, whatever. So that that was all. That was all just whatever. Yeah. yeah. If you guys see each other at the bank slalom or something. Well, see, I probably you know, haven't been in the same place. We haven't really. Time. You know, I uh, the, the last interaction I had with Terrier was like two years ago on Instagram, <laughs> and or no on Twitter. And oh. It, and it was bad news oh, bears. That was, was the whole that thing. was that uh, was Gus Kenworthy thing. The yeah. I okay. I. See, in a politically correct world, you can't say that for sure. But you get where he was no, coming from. No, I mean, from. and I understand that. We get it, here's, right? Here's my whole point of view. And like yeah. for, for the listeners that don't know what the hell is going on. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So right, right. Terry, Terry and I uh, hadn't spoken for at least 10 years. Right. Okay, and the fir- and Gus Kenworthy, the Olympic gold medalist for Halfpipe, I believe. I sure. think it was either Halfpipe or Slopestyle. This is after Sochi. He was the first like real high profile action sports athlete to come out as being gay, mm-hmm. and he he came out on on Twitter and it was like a really big thing, and out of fucking nowhere, Terry goes, uh, "Aren't all skiers gay?" No, Todd Richards came out something oh, yeah, something he named ten, you, right? ten years ago, and right. and aren't all skiers gay and. And I was like, wow, so that's so inside baseball and it's so out of, personal and, and, and out of yeah, nowhere. And, and I was nowhere. just like, what? Oh, and that's no. so I responded to Terry. Yeah. I'm like, what the fuck is your problem? Like, what the like fuck, number dude. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't the, drag me into this. Don't right. drag me into it. But right. it's also, you know, 
regardless of, of, of how it is in Norway, right? Like this right, is this right, kid's right, 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 biggest right, right, day right. of his life. Got and, it. and like, don't, it, it's not something to make light of. No, not, and, and I don't, I, I can't imagine him thinking stealing thunder. I think he's thinking it's hilarious. And so like, I've been defending that, but now under these, you under, just, under that but context, I, but at the same that's time, super lame. I understand in Norway, if he, he it's no or big if deal. he was really good friends with the guy, right. and it wasn't like there was no way anyone could take it any other way than he's but it was ribbing a, a friend. It was a subtle bite to have a subtle jab at skiing, and then but to use Gus coming like yeah. Gus's biggest yeah. moment I of got his you. life. I got you as like your. This yeah. is your stage. Like, I tried to get him to apologize because we talked about it on his thing. I was like, wouldn't you want to just like apologize for like, it was just shitty timing mm-hmm. or whatever. Or or like, obviously people just got bombed ba- on it, bad, man. Bad joke. Yeah. You don't want to be on that side of it right now. But he doubled. The thing is, is like, he doubled he down fucking doubled and down, he even dude. doubled down with me. He was like, no, I don't want to apologize. Okay, fine. That's cool. That's cool. Like, you can't tell him. Because he's he doesn't have the context for it. That's what it comes down to, is that I don't I I really honestly don't think he understands how big of a insult it was, to oh I think he does the world. I think I think enough. I think there was enough social media backlash. I mean, it was like an international news thing where it was I was international. I was, yeah, I was contacted by. Um, uh, New York Times about oh, it, like, and, and I actually called my agency that represented me. I'm like, what yeah. do I do with this? And like, yeah. do not touch don't it. touch it. Just I talked to it. NBC. I talked to all these people because yeah. all of a sudden, I the only thing that I responded with was like, dude, what what WTF? Like, yeah. this is you know, it's have some class and re- like, sure, what you, sure, you know, sure, it, it sure, was sure. like it was just a sure, response. Sure, sure, I didn't sure. I didn't say anything to him. I was like, I didn't no. even remember that this all went down. But, and then, damn. And, but then it like it grew on its own and all of yeah. a sudden, and then he doubled down on it. And then like all, all of a sudden all hell broke loose. And, and you know, there was all these like, um, uh, just the whole gay community piled on top of him. And sure. then, and then the sports associations piled on top of him and then media piled on top of him, yeah. like homophobic. Uh, Terry yeah. 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 And I'm meanwhile, I'm tied, tethered to this oh, by him. Random. So that's what I was bummed about. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I don't give a shit about your comment about me, sure. but you tied you me yeah. to an international <laughs> incident that I don't want to have a, it's like Tuesday. Like I, I don't have And each one of with. these media outlets yes. is having to explain every word and you're two of the words. In my, in, I'm in this. <laughs> and I oh saw God. him, I saw him the following, um, the following year at the Transworld Riders Poll Award. I ran yeah. into him and I just looked at him. I shook my head. I'm like, you motherfucker. <laughs> and he just he's like whoa and that was it like that was the interaction i but, re- you know, i still to this i still believe it he doesn't realize how big of a, of a blunder it was it, or what yeah to call it a blunder is it, like he's standing up for i think for he, he's against actually, this right. outrage the bigotry machine. against it totally, yeah. totally he's like the outrage machine is wrong mm-hmm. though right right and i'm like yeah it is but it is but, a thing, right? It's still a thing, so you should acknowledge it's mm-hmm. a thing. I and yeah, <laughs> if I was to say anything to him, it's like, and you da- dragged Todd into it, so there's that. That's that's the only thing that's that I was bummer. pissed about. Yeah, is that yeah, I was crazy. fielding uh, questions and comments from so yeah. many different angles, and yeah. I'm just like, what, dude? Why? Fuck. Like, were you a fan of his when he was oh, winning God, everything? Yeah. Of course, and yeah. I'm sure he was and a fan still, of you too. Because, still to this day, yeah. like, there's yeah. my favorite era of Terry was um was the cat board, era. cat board. Yeah, it was just the tricks he was doing. Yeah, the the outfits that he would like the the way the clothes fit him. You know, it was like one of the TV movies had some shots yeah. of him in yeah. it that I yeah. was just like that era. Dude, his this, pants fit proper. Everything, fit, everything, everything he was really perfect, nice. Dude. Yeah, like yeah, the yeah. Tri- like I said, the tricks he did. Yeah, yeah. And like you know, he did some lines in the pipe that mm. changed my life. Mm-hmm. That like he would do backside three sixty into this weird alley oop, uh, like an alley oop three sixty. Like from a switch alley three sixty, like a switch switch gate twist on the on the on your heel side wall. Yeah, and I'd never seen anyone do that before, and that I was like, oh my god, yeah, that is a game. And I, I mean, he his he, creativity he, matched with his his um a, a everything ability. was perfect at it's that era. Unreal. Everything was perfect, and yeah. I mean, it's like, look, I'm, it's freaking Terrier. Yeah, I yeah. mean, he his writing's incredible. 
his judgment and <laughs> and and life skills are are sometimes lacking but like you know uh, still i can appreciate i can i can yeah. divorce those two things and look at look at each one separately and you know terry yeah. is freaking terry he's like an introverted guy that has these punctuations of extroversion that mm-hmm. made me fucking yeah, I don't that know. one like, sucked it, it's i th- i think that i think that hawken um uh, you know he he did as well as he possibly could with his fame. You know, he yeah. had, he, and he yeah. still, he still has yeah. that level of fame where it's like if people worship him. Yeah. Like godlike worship. Yeah. When we were at Banff, people came up and, and were like, can I have your autograph? Like, can I have your autograph? I mean, That's when rad. he goes to Japan, the people are like, can I have your underwear? It's like, <laughs> you know, it's, there's, there's another, yeah. there's another level. And I think, you know, you, you think about a guy like Sean White mm-hmm. and even Mark McMorris to some, to some effect, they've, mm-hmm. You know, to a lesser effect, I think McMorris to Sean, like Sean's the same way. Like he affects people where, you know, when Terry used to go to Japan, girls would just cry. That's you nuts. know, it was full rock star. That's crazy. And it's to have, you know, if, think about Terry being, being Terry. You know, the peak of his like say he say he was like in the position of Sean White now, and like, you know, how would you even how would you deal with that? You know, yeah, it's, it's you crazy. guys, you guys actually kind of lucked out on that. Like, we skirted it a little bit. We had guys, enough of it yeah, that we yeah. could we could dip our toe into it when we went to the U.S. Open. And there was money that you right. guys had. You guys had money where some of the guys that are you know obviously better than anyone was back then now are just yeah, struggling and they're sponsor. they're working forty hours a week totally. and snowboarding in their spare time. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Um. It, so yeah, your era was the best. That's why I do the podcast. Is like. Because people really gravitate to like these well, stories. stories. They love it's like it. when yeah. and it's I, I find even with the engagement on the the devil of Instagram, it's like when I tell stories, yeah, I get the most interaction. Oh yeah, and for it's sure. and it's like I like telling those stories because I feel like there's a lot of kids that just don't they don't get it. Yeah. No. Right. You know? Yeah. Because I, I was shocked to see that. McMorris. That was, I'm like McMorris has a house. Yeah, McMorris lives down the street too. <laughs> it's it's like there's so many people what? that live within like a 15 minute. This uh, weird zone mm-hmm. for snowboarding is it's like just filled with amazing snowboarders. Yeah, it's crazy. And at, at any given day out in the water, you yeah, know, the local surf breaks around here. You've got Nika Backstrom. You've got Mark McMorris. You've got Sage Kotzenberg. You've got Torsten Horgmo. You've got uh, <laughs> Chaz Guldeman. You Jason Ford. Like you know, it's the icons of the generational yeah. icons. Of I have this to just sport. sit here with my mics and to just sit on the beach. Like, hey, you can literally yeah. go to either the Panikin, which, yeah. is, which is like the local, yeah. uh, you know, the local coffee shop, or any you know, post up at one of the beaches, and you know, then you, the, Dave Downing and then Brock <laughs> yeah. Crouch, and then, like the name, the names go on and on and on and That's on. That's nuts. It's crazy. What? It's still a magnet, like because McMorris is now. And mm-hmm. he's here. I think it's just because, you know, you can't snowboard while you're here. That's you, you true. Know, it's it's the ultimate decompression. Like when I lived in Breckenridge and I was living there full time, you're constantly in snowboarding. Yep. And it doesn't stop. Like you could pretty much ride. Well, like, I remember hearing there was a pipe that was lit all night. Was that true? That was you key, could hike key, it. Keystone. It was Keystone. Yeah, you could hike at you could night. Hike it at was night. like just in the middle. It was of, just around. Like you could just. That's so it, rad. And to be like completely, completely stuck in snowboarding yeah. all the time. All the time. It, I yeah. think it, I think it melts your brain a little bit. So sure. I think that's why people like to come here to the beach because it's Decompress. a full decompressing. Yeah, that's so <clears> dope. <throat> that's so rad. Let's talk a bit about New Greens because that's how I okay. got hooked up with yeah, you. Right, sure. Is through Devin. So New Greens is a is a supplement company. So I've known Devin Ryerson is the is the guy who started. I've known Devin. Devin rode for Sims when I was on Sims. Whoa! And so Dumb. our paths connected back on my first trip ever with Sims at Donner Ski Ranch. I Rad. met I met Devin Ryerson with Tucker Franzen and Chris Roach. Damn. So we had just become friends back back in the day, and then like ten years ago, I'm in the water and this guy paddles up. He's like, "Hey, Todd." And I'm looking at him like. Devin Ryerson and he's like he's like yeah and it was so funny that you know all all paths kind of lead back so Devin Devin does this company called New Greens he had he was diagnosed with cancer and needed to figure out a lifestyle change to beat you know to basically beat beat back the cancer and do what he could and 
he came up with uh, a superfood, and I mean he's a doc- he's a doctor. It's Doctor Devin. We call him <laughs> Doctor Devin. Oh, that's right. And um, yeah, so that's that's how. So what is it you to have it in the morning? Yeah, I just have it in the morning. I'm just... going to grab a bunch. Just, he put a package together yeah. for me. So. He just got back in town. He actually just he texted me a little while ago. He's like, I'm here. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, it's just you know it's it's in a powder form, and you yeah. you can blend it up in a smoothie or whatever. And you it's, have it's it great. have it first thing in the morning. You're good all yeah, day kind you're of good. thing. Mm-hmm. That's rad. Yeah, you've been a part of a lot of really cool companies the last few years. Yeah, it's weird. Like I just kind of felt. Like I fell into the St. Archer beer. Yeah. It was like a thing that one of my buddies uh, started. And he's like, do you want to be a part of this? And like, hell you yeah. know, I was like, okay. So you guys build it up and sell it or did it? Yeah, we got built yeah. up and sold to Miller Coors. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was a pretty, it was a pretty cool thing that I had no... I had no idea that was going to happen. Yeah. Well, it's just down the street here, too. They've yeah, got St. Archer's. That's the brewery. Um, brewery. I mean, uh, the tasting room. Tasting room. That was yeah. that happened after we sold it. Oh, okay. Um, so they did it as yeah, a... Yeah, then they yeah. kind of... You know, it's still, a, it's still a pretty big brand here, but we're completely completely removed once you sell it you're like okay we're gonna cash those checks but we did yeah we did villager after that and villager's a coconut which was coconut water Mm -hmm. yeah we're still that's still kicking yeah so what's the deal behind that it was just like anti-energy drink kind of thing yeah that's pretty much how how it was and there was you know paul rodriguez is involved and there was a whole bunch of guys that we wanted to get involved with saint archer but they couldn't because they were they were recovering alcoholics they're like i would love to be a part of this yeah 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 and like pro skate guys but like andrew reynolds i can't go near that sure sure so villager came up and it was like what's something that we all you know what's good and it gets because i mean look red bull as much as money as they're pumping into action sports and rockstar and monster it's poison dude it's straight up poison (laughs) yeah and it's you know you can't in a right mind send that message to kids it's like this is this is yeah like do you let your kids thing. drink it i'm like Fuck kids no, you cannot dude. drink that unless it's... you want to have like instant diabetes <laughs> yeah yeah exactly. so we we had to come up with something that was like that we could have in good conscience promote and yeah. and that's where um that's where villager came in and and we could bring on guys like andrew reynolds who were who couldn't go near the alcohol category because of because of their past yeah so you know these guys are living clean lifestyles now and and and, you know, coconut water is, a, is what is it's infused with different flavors kind of thing. It can be, yeah. you know, we have a couple of different things we've done. Like, you know, we've diverse from the, from the coconut water. We do kids juice, all organic kids juice boxes. And, right. You know, the, Oh, the, that's, that's a good. Move. Yeah. And it's like the coconut water. It's a base for, um, for smoothies as well. Like yeah. we have, we have, uh, franchises that use villager as the base for their smoothies Sick. that they do. So it's, it's, it's out there. And it has a social impact element, mm-hmm. right? Like you guys give back. Or, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. We, you know, we, we give back to, like a lot of our stuff is done in Thailand and we give back to Thailand and, and you know, there's a multitude of causes that, that are addressed. So from, rad. Yeah. Did you get in on the on the water bottle thing that, that UC does? No, that's really cool though. Mizu. Yeah. Mizu, yeah. UC actually, awesome. he's he's gone from that now. Oh, I believe, is he? He, I believe okay. he's out of that. But, you know, that was another thing too is like, it was a it was a conscience uh, a conscious cause. Yeah, man. And it's you know, water bottles are a weird one because you make these water bottles and then pretty soon, you can only have so many water bottles at your house. Yeah, so it's like true. one of the it's like yeah. kind of like the Crocs formula. Like we we're making an <laughs> yeah. indestructible shoe and they're like people are like killer for like a year and then like why would we buy another pair? Like, yeah. These are not going to break. So it was kind of <laughs> like water bottles. Like they Mizu, they were, it was really hard to grow it because. Sure. All of a sudden, everyone had the coolest water bottle. Yeah, I don't need thirty of the coolest water bottle. So, like, how do you grow that? And I think uh, you know, UC stepped away and liked to kind of dabble more in the design element. And yeah, he's so doing lots of yeah. Design him and Brad stuff, Kramer are right? doing like that yeah. design agency now. Yeah, yeah, that's so crazy. And we, awesome. he lives down the street too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what a nutty, nutty yeah, zone. En- Encinitas is, um, you know, we've affectionately labeled it as god's waiting room for aging snowboarders. <laughs> this is where you, this is where you come this is where you get put out to pastures in Cenitas, and it's not a horrible place to be put out to pastures. yeah no doubt um if you want to surf and you want to skate yeah, and yeah. it's heaven on earth i'd have to learn how to surf i've i've had a terrible surf trajectory because we tried to surf cape cod just like wind that, see that's where i grew yeah, up surfing yeah. is cape cod really yeah and that water is not warm and now it's shark infested so it's like Yeesh. i guess surfing is one of those weird ones where like uh it's only good sometimes right 
there's a lot of elements that want to like hurt and eat you. Oh yeah. So it's like it's <laughs> when you really boil surfing down to it's like raw elements, it kind of it's not very inviting. No, and then also on my side, I'm ADHD or whatever it is, and I'm always strategizing for the least amount of effort for the most amount of thing. <laughs> and surfing is diametrically opposed to that. You got to put the most amount yeah. of effort to do wh- for a, the minimal, a fucking turn, yeah. one turn. And then you can, oh but the God. thing is though, is like with surfing, it's that one turn incredibly rewarding. That's what they tell me. I'm a, t- I'm a terrible advocate for surfing. Although I wish I could do it. Mm-hmm. I think if I move somewhere like this, it's a lot more friendly here. It would be better. It's user friendly. User friendly. Mm-hmm. But then I paddle out in the lineup, and I'm that kook that's out. Whatever. Of Everyone's kooks everywhere. I saw a lot of people out. Mm-hmm. The last time I was down here, it was relatively big, mm-hmm. and there was one guy out in no wetsuit, and I was like, ah, that guy, it's that's a hard, ass. that's a hard charger. Either yeah. that or he's just poor. I, or he, <laughs> yeah, he forgot his suit Can't, that he just day. Didn't have a wetsuit. Like, oh my god, he was ripping. Mm-hmm. He got like three waves while everybody else was just kind of waiting. Well, he's probably because he had to keep moving. Yeah, he had to keep moving, he, and then he came in. Death. He was like, "I'm gonna die." Right on, Todd. Cool. Man, thank you so thank much for you. doing this. We got to do this again the next time I'm down. Let's do it here. in the snow and do it in the snow, or come up to you. Come up to Vancouver. We're, at some we're point. actually kind of throwing around. Brian Fox and has been kind of throwing around the idea of going up and, and riding Seymour or Grouse or something like oh, that. Oh, that'd be in so much spring. fun. It's. It. I mean, yeah. that's my favorite time to be there. Is well, hit me up when you're there because yeah. that's yeah. Seymour in the spring is like it's the world shit. class. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Well, thanks, dude. Awesome. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Thank dude. You, man. That's, right. that's fun. <laughs> F and Rad shout outs this week to Todd Richards. Thanks, man, for doing the show. That was awesome. I'm going to thank all the sponsors here. Vans has presented season five, and I couldn't be happier to be affiliated with such an awesome company. I have it on good authority that Vans still provides Jamie Lim with a good chunk of his income, so that's amazing. And today, Vans signed Tony Hawk. That's epic. Vans has also put together a program called Foot the Bill to help core retailers through the COVID struggle. So proud to be affiliated with you guys. Wired Snowboards, made right here in vancouver we're doing a raffle right now to help ensure wired can keep the doors open after the lockdown tickets are 20 bucks and you can get one by sending an e-transfer or paypal payment to effingradpodcast at hotmail.com we're going to be doing this draw soon tickets are more than halfway sold thank you to everybody who's bought one so far you win any size any shape wired board and you can design a custom graphic to put on top So go to wiredsnowboards.com to check out what they've got. The Boardroom Snowboard Shop is still selling stuff online. Go to boardroomshop.com and choose from the best brands in the business. Use offer code FNRAD10 to save an additional 10% off their sale pricing. Also, the Boardroom has pledged a hoodie for the raffle. So you get to pick any size, any color. So stoked. Crow's Nest Barbershops is where we get our haircuts. And you should too because they're cool as shit. And John Roth is a hell of a human. John became a dad this year, and I, for one, can't be more proud of the father he's become. Big love to John and his entire family and everyone at Crow's Nest. Get your hair cut there once they reopen the doors after the COVID lockdown. And on Optics is a subsidiary of Burton, and they donated 1,300 pairs of Anon goggles to doctors during this COVID pandemic. They also are donating 500,000 face masks. And there's even an employee-led initiative to make face masks at home while they're locked out of going into their job. Amazing job, all you people at Burton and Anon. Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, BC is running online sales still. So please support Mark and Shane at Tribute. Shop online for skate, snow, and fashion. These are amazing humans. Big love to Tribute. And thank you to the local mountains, Grouse Mountain, Mount Seymour, and Cypress Mountain. I could never pick just one. I love all of them, and they all help with the show this season by generously giving me lift passes. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Also, thank you, Tony LaFroy, for the wax support this season. Thank you, Crystal at Intuition, for keeping my feet in Intuition Liners. Go to intuitionliners.com, buy salmon arm mitts. Order the sandwich video. Thanks to Tyler at Volcom for the kit. Thanks to Brian and Mike at Dekine. I use my Dekine mitts, pants, and vests for a second season, and they all held up amazingly. This was supposed to be the last episode of the season, but there's one more next week. So be sure to come back 
for another episode of the Evan Red Snowboard Podcast presented by Vans and brought to you by SIA Productions.